What's the best energy source? At the end of 2021, I set out to answer that question in a video on how to calculate the cost of energy from different sources. And I used a car race metaphor to illustrate the different components that make up that cost. Construction, financing, fuel, and operations and maintenance. I got a ton of comments asking me to include more information. And so this is that update. By popular request, I've added nuclear and geothermal power in addition to coal, gas, solar, and wind that were in the original video. And we'll rerun the car race using data from Lazard's latest levelized cost of energy report to see which of the six generation types comes out cheapest. Then in the second half of the video, we'll look at another topic that came up a lot in the comments of the previous video. What are the assumptions behind the cost calculations? Do they include subsidies, the cost of firming renewables with energy storage or transmission that would need to be added? The short answer to that is no, those generally aren't included in standard LCOE calculations and they weren't in the first video. But in this video, we'll look at the effect of subsidies and how much it would cost to add storage and transmission to enable a stable and reliable electricity grid with a lot of wind and solar in it. I need to thank my friend John Poljak who runs a website Key Numbers for doing the calculations for this video for me using the data from and similar assumptions to Lazard's Level X cost of energy version 15. I'm Rosie Barnes. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. All right, so to start, let's go back to the racetrack to see how the start grid is looking. We've now got six cars on the grid, nuclear and geothermal, in addition to coal, combined cycle gas, onshore wind, and utility scale solar. The grid position is decided by the cost to build 500 megawatts of capacity. In the previous four-way race, solar at 400 million per 500 megawatts took pole position, followed by gas, then wind, then coal way back at 3.1 billion. Where does geothermal and nuclear fit in? 500 100 megawatts of geothermal power generator costs about $2.8 billion, a little cheaper than coal. And nuclear, well, 500 megawatts of nuclear comes in at $6.4 billion. It it's just incredibly expensive to build a brand new nuclear power plant, though they do last a long time, which we'll factor in later. So nuclear takes last place on the grid, which remember is just how much it costs to install 500 megawatts of capacity. So nuclear, coal and geothermal have the most expensive equipment. They've got a bit of a handicap to start with, but maybe they can make it up later as we add in the effects of lifetime production, finance costs, fuel and maintenance. So that's the starting grid sorted. Now, ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. Get the race started. We're going to move from the capacity of each power plant to the actual energy it produces in its life. That's a function of how long the plant is expected to last and how much it produces on average, its capacity factor. Nuclear power plants have the highest capacity factor of the techs in our race at 89%. That means a one gigawatt nuclear power plant on average generates 890 megawatts. And nuclear power plants last a long time too, 40 years. Geothermal also has a high capacity factor at 80%, but a shorter expected life of 25 years. Compare that to the more mainstream energy techs with 66% capacity factor for coal and only 23% for solar, and a 40 year life for coal down to just 20 years for gas and wind turbines. So combining lifetime and capacity factor, we get a cost per megawatt hour based purely on how much the equipment costs and how much electricity it will produce in its lifetime. Is that high capacity factor and long lifetime enough to see nuclear catch up to the other technologies? No, it is not. <laughs> Nuclear has caught up a bit, but it still sits in last place by a while. At the front of the race, solar is still in first place, but gas has caught up nearly level to the lead and coal with its relatively long lifetime has snuck ahead of geothermal for now. The next corner sees financing costs added, how much it costs the developer to get the money it needs for the project. We use the same cost of capital for all technology types, 7.7%, and then what differentiates a project is the lifetime of the project. At the front of the race, gas has pulled in front of solar to lead the race, and at at the back, we see geothermal re-overtake coal and nuclear nuclear is falling further behind. Let's see what happens when we get to the next corner, fuel costs. Only gas, coal, and nuclear need to pull in for a refueling pit stop. Renewable energies, wind, solar, and geothermal just keep going. Gas prices have been crazy recently, but we're not going to worry about that for now. We'll use long-term averages here. Coal is normally about $17 per megawatt hour produced and gas $24. And uranium, while super expensive per kilo compared to coal and gas, it's actually a lot cheaper per megawatt hour at $9 because it's extremely energy dense compared to fossil fuels. Refueling has really shaken up the race order. Wind and solar have pulled ahead of gas, but geothermal didn't quite catch up. And nuclear gets closer to coal, but didn't manage to overtake and it still sits in last place. The final corner is operations and maintenance. All the thermal generators, coal, gas, nuclear, and geothermal have a variable component to their maintenance costs, which depends on how much they generate. And all technologies have fixed costs for operations and maintenance. 
Geothermal has the highest O&M cost, mostly due to its much higher variable maintenance cost. And solar has the lowest O&M. So where do we end up after all that? Crossing the finish line in first place is still solar, followed by wind and gas to round out the podium. Exactly the same as in the first version of this video. But geothermal has cheaper energy than coal. And nuclear? Well, nuclear is way off the back. Everyone else has pretty much gone home already by the time that nuclear crosses the line. So that is the cost of electricity from those six sources. The input data that we've used here is from Lazard. They are US figures intended to create a power plant model representing an illustrative project for each relevant technology. And I'll put the link in the description so you can read all their assumptions. There are LCOE calculations for a wider range of countries put out by ARENA every two years and by IEA every five years. And of course, the values will be different for different countries. Obviously, a solar panel in Australia will be more productive than a solar panel in Denmark and the opposite for wind turbines in those two places. Then there aren't suitable geothermal resources everywhere you might like to use it. And even coal power plants can get lower fuel costs if there's a coal mine like right next door. And as so many people commented in the previous video, LCOE can be useful, but it definitely doesn't tell the whole story. It excludes so many factors that are needed if you're trying to make a decision about a specific energy project. In the previous video, I talked about the value of electricity using Valco, value adjusted LCOE, and showed that solar power tends to be less valuable than other sources as all solar in a region will generate at the same time. And that peak doesn't usually match when peak demand is. And that's the reason why anyone bothers to build a gas peaker plant which is much less efficient than combined cycle gas turbines, but their flexibility means they generate electricity when it's more valuable. Let's talk about some of the other important information that the LCOE values in our car race leave out. There are so many, I'm just gonna focus on the ones that were commented on in that first video that I made. The most common comment was probably the topic of subsidies. We use the Lazard data in our car race and it's supposed to give unsubsidized costs, but subsidies aren't always that easy to identify. Governments give out subsidies for all kinds of different energy sources. Sometimes they are direct subsidies like tax credits, grants and loan programs or indirect support such as feed-in tariffs or renewable energy certificates. But sometimes they're harder to spot, like governments building roads or rail or port infrastructure, or the way that the external environmental and health costs of burning fossil fuels are not included in their LCOE. And then there is the topic of energy storage. Renewable energies like wind and solar are intermittent, so they need some kind of backup or long-term storage to be able to reliably provide electricity when it's needed. And traditional nuclear power plants are baseload power sources that provide constant energy independent of the weather, but they can't turn on and off quickly, and so they need to be combined with flexible generation like gas peakers or batteries. The other issue people mentioned was the cost of grid connection and transmission, which can add a lot to project costs for generators in remote locations like wind tends to be. If those costs aren't included in the LCOEs, then they're not really representative of the total cost. Furthermore, if governments pay for new transmission or pay backup generators or storage to be available when wind and solar aren't, then that could be seen as a kind of subsidy to renewables. So this was another topic that was much commented on in the past video. It's not a fair race if we ignore the extra costs of adding storage and transmission, but it is not so easy to come up with a value. Adding a bit of rooftop solar when it's only a few percent of total generation doesn't really add any cost, but when variable renewable proportions get really high and when a lot of new generation is added far from where it can be used, then significant costs are added. And it's obviously going to be highly dependent on local conditions too, depending on how diverse wind and solar resources are and where they are located in relation to load centers. And furthermore, it matters what other generation types are in the grid. A solar only grid is going to take a lot more storage than one that also contains wind and a wind only grid would need a lot more transmission. For Australian conditions, the Australian energy market operator, AEMO, together with science research organization, CSIRO, have been putting out gen cost reports for the past few years, which calculate LCOE for gas, coal, solar, and wind. The interesting part of that report is that for solar and wind, they include integration costs, enough storage and transmission to ensure a reliable grid. And they calculate it for 60% to 90% variable renewable energy share, which in the latest report resulted in an extra 16 to 28 Australian dollars per megawatt hour. Based on the Australian values for LCOE calculated, this report finds that a reliable grid made up of 90% wind and solar combined with enough storage and transmission still provides cheaper electricity than gas and coal. 
So this will look different in every country. And I really expect Australia to have one of the easiest, fastest and cheapest energy transitions. So you can't really extrapolate this info onto any other country. Places with high winter energy needs in particular will need to add much more storage, whether that's electricity or heat or hydrogen or, or whatever. So it will surely cost more there. But still, I think the Gen Cost report results are very encouraging, especially if you consider that most countries won't get to high proportions of variable renewables for a while. Australia plans to get to 82% renewable electricity by 2030, which includes hydro providing around 6% probably. And the US has a goal of 100% clean electricity by 2035, including nuclear and hydro, which make up a little over 10% of the mix today. The cost trajectory of renewables and battery storage tends to be a lot faster than fossil fuels or nuclear. So by the time we need storage and transmission for 90% variable renewables, it will be cheaper than our current assumptions. And one other factor to consider, it's been a wild couple of years for fuel prices, and the fuel costs used in our calculations are starting to look very low. Depending on how these trends play out, by the time we get to 90% variable renewables, I don't think there will be any penalty at all for fully integrated wind and solar versus alternative electricity generation in most parts of the world. Of course, we could do this all day, play around with the assumptions and get different answers. No doubt you have opinions about the assumptions that I've made in this video and ideas about what you think would be more realistic ones. And I think that is super fun. And so I'm going to get John Poljak from Key Numbers on for a live stream in about a week to run through the key numbers for a bunch of these different scenarios. As well as changing fuel prices to reflect the increases over the last year or two, we might change assumptions on capacity factor to reflect the trends towards coal plants operating less of the time or new nuclear's current woes in France, where it's currently sitting at, I think, something like 60% capacity factor for 2022. Or we could change asset lifetimes or financing assumptions, anything at all. So if there's something specific that you'd like to see, then write it in the comments or tune in live for the live stream. I'll put a link in the description. A big thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team whose support makes these videos more frequent and more professionally produced. If you want to join us, then you can join at this link and we would love to welcome you to the exclusive Discord server to chat all things clean tech and help shape the future of the channel. Or if you'd like to make a one-off contribution, there is also a buy me a coffee link in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.